Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. I am your host today, Cameron Guerra, uh, an engineer at IT Pro TV. And with me today, we have a co-worker of mine and my boss, Taylor. How's it going, man? It's going good. Thanks for having me on the show, Cam. Yeah, man. I you know, figured you know, we're in a new year, so happy 2021, everyone. Um, and, you know, we've we got to take a time to, to look back at what we have come from. You know, 2020 was filled with a lot of stuff. You know, we all transitioned to work from home. We all figured out how to communicate still without in-face meetings and figured out how to use Zoom, which some of us are still questionable at. Speaking about Lots myself. Lots of programs. We got Zoom. We got Teams. We got Discord. We tried a bunch of others. That we did. Yeah. <laughs> But hey, we're, we're making it through, you know, day by day. Um, and, and thank you, listeners, for joining us today. But yeah, so today we're going to talk about a little bit about 2020 for us, um, and then also uh, kind of dive into a post that was written by Adam Westpizer about lessons learned from a year of writing Haskell, um, which is a great post. Uh, definitely would encourage you. It's in um, edition 241. 245 I, i've lost track of the issue numbers of haskell weekly which you know you think if anybody knew i would know but <laughs> yeah it's 245 it's the most recent one so i guess this is yeah this is from 245 it, i mean it was easy when i was on issue like seven but right when you're up in the 200s it's been a while yeah we've got we've got a lot so yeah go check it out in issue 245 of haskell weekly um and this is the 33rd episode of Haskell Weekly Podcast. So, you know, we're getting up there. We're going to start losing count of these as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, so today we're going to talk about this post um, by Adam. And he actually gives a shout out to Haskell Weekly. So thank you, Adam. We're glad you yeah, uh, thanks, Adam. enjoy the, the weekly update of what's happening in the world of Haskell. Uh, you know, it's definitely a kind of a sparse field sometimes. And so <laughs> when we have a place like Haskell Weekly to go and, you know, read articles about Haskell and other functional programming languages. It's kind of you know, nice. funny, funny you mentioned that because when I started Haskell Weekly, I was afraid that some weeks there just wouldn't be anything or there'd be like two links to publish or something like that. And surprisingly, that has never been the case. There's never been a shortage of content. So uh, just, I guess, thank from me, thank you to the whole Haskell community for writing so much good stuff with such regularity. It makes my job collecting all of it a lot easier. Exactly. Yeah. I, I would also have that fear, I think, of starting some sort of weekly news pot, you know, news grouping of articles and then not have anything to post. But, mm -hmm. you know, the Haskell Weekly po Haskell community is coming in <laughs> strong for they us sure at Haskell Weekly. Um, but awesome. All right, Taylor. Well, I want to kind of jump in um, and I, I want you to kind of share maybe some of the, the highlights of your 2020 and, you know, something you've learned, you know, work or Haskell related um, that, you know, you, you were like, oh, this is pretty sweet. Oh man, you think I would have prepped for this, but, uh, the questions catch me a little off guard. Uh, I'm going to stall and pull one of the quotes that Adam put in this article that I really agreed with. And I'm not sure that it's something that has changed for me in 2020, but he says that an important perspective when writing code is understanding how it will exist through time and what demands will be placed on it and how the fundamental assumptions that code makes will inevitably change. And for me in my career as a software engineer, that's something that I've just seen come true over and over again, where like sometimes there's a focus on how do I make this code as clever or performant or whatever as possible in isolation. But really what's important is like, is it easy to change over time? And even as it passes hands, you know, through a team or something like that. At least in my career, that's the thing that has been important because I've worked on long running software with large teams of people, uh, or maybe large as a misnomer. I, I typically work for startups, so, you know, like less mm -hmm. than 10 people, but more than one. And that's, that's large, I think. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think any programmer knows that, you know, code you write five, you know, five minutes ago is now legacy and <laughs> something has changed. Um, and cause we experience that every day working through a legacy API that, I, I've been at IT Pro for a long time, and I literally just today I was looking at code I wrote in JavaScript four years ago, and I was like, "Wow, this is you were a different person back then." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, this is going to be great. Woo, it's awesome. <laughs> now it's trash, but that's okay. You know, we've learned, and you know, well, and now it's in the trash. So 
it's Ooh, where it belongs. Yes, I did delete over 5,000 lines of code today, so that's, that's uh, a good day. A good day at the office. Uh, so that's yeah. my non-answer to your question, Cam. What's nice. your answer about 2020? Yeah. I mean, uh, actually, it's funny because this is something Adam kind of mentioned at one point um, is using stack. Or not stack. Well, yes, using stack. He does mention <laughs> that. He's been using that. But what I meant to say is he's been uh, using servant or he mentioned servant um, as far as like some type level shenanigans that you can kind of learn that will you know really be helpful in the long run. And I think we've really you know benefited from switching our api over to servant and slowly moving routes over because you know we've been getting documentation for free we've been getting um, a lot of you know benefits out of switching over to servant testing for free certain types of tests yeah we get testing for free we get a lot of great benefits from over some of the other you know our other api that we framework we use hapstack you know hapstack was good at the time but now we've kind of understood the fundamentals of Haskell a little bit better and we can kind of conceptualize type level shenanigans a little bit more as a team. And so I'm really happy that our team's kind of just taken servant by storm and really, you know, just really creating an API that's a joy to work in, um, you know, especially as a web yeah. API. And that, uh, you know, touches on something else that Adam talks about in this post of in general, preferring to write junior code, but knowing the team you're with and knowing what they can handle and changing what you write to fit that. So for me, you know, one of the reasons that we were using Hapstack was that it is, I mean, it's got some complicated stuff behind the scenes, but generally when you use it, it's pretty straightforward. It's just like write stuff in a monad and it'll work. Um, whereas servant has a much higher bar to clear and you get a lot of benefits from it, but I have been pleasantly surprised that our team, which has quite a few junior engineers on it that are not familiar with Haskell, um, has been able to pick up servant and run with it. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that helps to have also senior people on the team that have kind of led the way, um, and kind of, I don't know, demystified some of what's happening. Um, so we can all kind of learn from one another, um, really well. And, and I think honestly, 2020 was a year that we had to grow together, you know, in a different kind of way, you know, usually we're in the office and we're sitting next to each other and, you know, we, we all, we've been pairing for a long time, but I think at this point, 2020 kind of pushed us to be even a tighter knit group where, mm -hmm. you know, we're communicating better. We're teaching each other, you know, healthy habits and just really, you know, helping each other, uh, you know, build together as our, our company slogan currently uh, <laughs> is, uh, but, you know, that's, you know, that's what 2020 really offered us. So, you know, I'm really thankful for that. Um, and I think, you know, for us as a team, we're at like, what, year two, year three of Haskell writing? Three, a little yeah. more than three, because I joined right after y'all had switched to Haskell and I'm coming up on my third year. Mm, okay. Yeah. So we're in three years of writing Haskell. And, you know, I think last year was really a year that we stopped worrying about JavaScript code or worrying about migrations from various platforms and we've been just really solely working on the IT Pro TV product. Uh -huh. So I think that was really great. Um, yeah. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, the remote members of our team are very glad that we're uh, remote first now. Everyone's in the same shoes that they've been in the whole time. So we understand their plight a little better. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, so, uh, back to the post too, is he, he talks about, um, type level witnesses, which he tried out. Um, he had a little, little difficulty. Um, and honestly, I've really never heard of, you know, the type level witnesses. So I really should probably follow the blog post because he linked to a type level witness blog post. So I should definitely check that out. But do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't, I pulled up the blog post, so I'm trying to scan it really quick. If I had to guess, I think this would be about the like, um, ghosts of departed proofs paper where you encode information in the, at the type level so that once you prove something via like a smart constructor, you have evidence of that proof that you can carry along. So the canonical example would be like, 
um, you have proved that a number is odd. So now your type is odd number rather than just number or integer or whatever. Um, and in general, like you can do that with new type wrappers for any particular type. But in general, if you want to connect like uh, refinements or constraints to stuff, there's a more principled way to do all of that. And I think that's what this type level witness stuff is. Although maybe I could be grossly misrepresenting it. So uh, I apologize if I am. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll cover that in another week's uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Haskell Weekly podcast here, you know. Um, but yeah, okay, so thank you for trying to give me some insight there. Uh, yeah, and so my my uh, reading of his, you know, hesitation about using type-level witnesses is that they are nice and they give you some good things, but the interface for using them is too clunky or too complex or too difficult for him. Um, which I think is a fair complaint, not just about type level witnesses, but um, many things in type level Haskell. And, you know, for me, that was one of the reasons I pushed back on servant for so long. It's like, well, yeah, I, I can see all the benefits, but I'm not sure what all the downsides are. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely, you know, with high overhead to understand something, it, it really tends to rub me the wrong way as well, because I'm like, well, you know, it's not just me uh, that's writing this code. Like, it's an entire team. We all need to be able to, to handle this. And if it's clunky and hard to use, like, it's just mm -hmm. not ready then, you know? And, and it's not only is it hard to write or use, but, like, maintain or understand when something goes wrong. We ran into that the other day with Servant, where we had moved an endpoint from our old service to our new one, and it wasn't behaving the same. And, like, everything we could look at was the same and it was, oh, something behind the scenes that Servant is doing that's actually more correct. And it, like, it's good that it's doing that thing, but we weren't aware of that. So it was hard for us to debug this problem because we were looking at our application code rather than the, you know, Servant code. Right. Yeah. But, you know, with time, everybody kind of can work through those clunks and, you know, maybe Adam in 2021 can, you know, master with, you know, type level witnesses and, you know, look yeah. forward to reading his post next january uh, <laughs> i finally figured out type level witnesses yes <laughs> or maybe hey if you want to write it in 2021 i'm all for it mm -hmm. definitely down to, to check it out uh yeah um so i think this is something we faced and we've gone through many iterations of build systems and you know we've you know, we're using stack but we know its limitations and we're we rub up against it we've thought about nix like and, and he kind of mentions this in the blog post and he's kind of gives his his two cents per se about it um which i thought was was you know informative i think you know for us we want all the caching we could get so if we could do nicks like we're all about it but like he says it's a little complicated and so we've kind of you know we have some team members who use nicks os and they will not be named they're great <laughs> um <laughs> But names have been all. changed to protect the innocent. Yeah, I mean, Nix has been like a pipe dream for us for years and not so much like Nix, the technology, but the stuff that it brings, like you mentioned with caching, because we have spent a lot of engineering hours trying to get the caching, not only on our local machines, but on CI uh, to get our caching in a good place with stacks so that we don't spend, you know, 15 minutes waiting for a really small change to go through our CI process. Yeah, so you're say, saying if we could get the cash right, we would save a lot of cash. <laughs> <laughs> Very true, yeah. yeah. You're yeah. welcome. I'll be here all year. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Outrage from from viewers. Get this kid off of this. <laughs> we can't handle okay. those Haskell puns anymore. Kick him off the podcast. He's out of here. <laughs> all right, well, then you'll get Taylor by himself. Cause we've My tried. puns are just as bad fair but hey at least we've got them right mm -hmm. dad jokes for days yeah um but yeah i i liked hearing his take on build systems because it kind of matches ours like we're using stack there are some things about it that annoy us but not enough to push us on anything else and something like nix would be great we could probably get away with using cabal directly but stack gives us some niceties that we want to stick with although i was surprised to hear that this like flat namespace error that he mentions. I don't think I've ever seen that. And we have eight people working on stack, working with stack all day, every day. Um, so I don't know. He says the dreaded, like it's some well-known thing. I've never mm -hmm. seen it. Knock on wood. Yeah. 
same yeah we're, tomorrow we'll come into work oh i guess <laughs> tomorrow's a saturday but come in monday and it's gonna be just like oh no nobody can work today we're all work through this problem together mm -hmm. um but yeah so then, then he moves on from build systems to kind of some of the tools which i guess can play into the build system uh but you know sounds like he's a ghcid fan which we here at it pro tv are also ghcid fans yeah, it's surprising how helpful GHCID is, given that it's such a simple tool. Like, it hardly does anything. In principle, mm -hmm. it's like if you started GHCI and just hit colon reload over and over again every time you saved a file. But that's really helpful. I mean, GHC is a nice compiler, um, especially once you're familiar with how it reports errors to you. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, that, like, GHCID by itself is great. So um, thank you, Neil Mitchell, for starting that Woo. yeah and then we've got you know something i think we've tried here at it pro at least a few of us have is uh getting haskell language server up and going um you know we've caused some crashes from that <laughs> yeah, i was gonna say it's a running joke that when one of our one of the guys on our team runs hls it's like well he, his machine's gonna crash sometime in the next 48 hours we don't mm -hmm. know when but it'll happen <laughs> Yeah, but I mean that would work if you turn your machine off every night. But yeah, and and this was a long time ago that this you know internal meme came up. So I'm sure HLS is better, um, but we haven't tried it in the meantime. Yeah, yeah, it's been a minute because um, HLS and HIE all kind of merged together, right? I have not been able to keep track of all the naming and merging, but I think that's true. Or HLS includes HIE or something like that. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, but yeah, they fixed a bunch of memory leaks and supposedly it's a lot better and faster now, but I haven't given it another chance. Yeah. You know, I just use this uh, little Atom or uh, VS Code plugin called Purple Yoke <laughs> that this guy made. It's actually I didn't good. want to plug my own plugin, but yes, <laughs> I wrote one called Purple Yoke and it behaves a lot like GHCID where really it just spins up GHCI in the background and reloads it for you a bunch and gives you the little red squiggly underlines, which works really well for me. Hey, more to come in 2021, I'm probably going <laughs> Yeah, I might make like three commits to it this year. woo -hoo. Hey, <laughs> if we could get like a quick jump or something working with it, that would be pretty chill. Well, yeah, I was going to say one of the other tools that he mentions is Hask Tags, and that has been really useful. Again, it's like a relatively simple tool, and it doesn't do a whole lot, but just being able to say like keyboard shortcut, jump to where this thing is defined, mm -hmm. amazingly useful. Because I do that all the time. And what I used to do was select it and search through the whole project for it. And then like, oh, no, these are your call sites, not definition sites. Yeah. Ugh. It's yeah. caveman. Yeah. It, yeah. I still am stuck doing that because <laughs> I haven't, I don't know if, I guess I lost my hashtags configuration or something along those lines with mm. uh, VS Code. But uh, so I really haven't been doing that. I've been doing the control shift F with the highlighted word and yeah. then being like, uh scroll 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 oh there it is okay mm -hmm. so, need a maybe that's one of my 2021 resolutions is get that get your tooling again. working again yeah it's like it's one of those things like it broke but it wasn't a huge inconvenience yeah um i, I don't know i guess i have a high tolerance for inconvenience well you know it's a little thing where you don't feel the pain that much it's like oh yeah it took me five seconds to find this definition instead of one second and maybe you don't do that operation enough for it to matter or it's like just part of your workflow so mm -hmm. you go and you keep minding you're like Bloop. oh good there we are mm -hmm. yeah so anyhow definitely think the tooling in, in 2020 was you know there's some ma major improvements that happened there um for sure so yeah team ghgid always all reliable at this point hls is the cool new shiny toy that you know, has a squeaky wheel here and there. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, so then he kind of moves on, um, talking about the release of GHC nine. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, that's a big one, which maybe we should do a whole episode on that, but I feel like I'm not qualified for it. Cause the big, like, you know, headline release or feature for GHC nine is linear types, which are really exciting, but I don't, really know anything about them so <laughs> well, hey it'll be about. good maybe we'll learn about it and then talk about it it'll be good practice yeah that'd be good yeah 
but yeah, the first release candidate for GHC nine was released. Um, I think I installed it on one of my machines, but I haven't really played with it yet. Mm. Yeah, I haven't at all. Didn't even know there was a pre-release version. <laughs> so, you know, that's how in the know I am here. Uh, just ha- hosting the Haskell Weekly podcast. No big deal. Yeah. I'm Don't kind of in the Haskell. Okay. Wait, wait, there's a GHC nine. Whoa. <laughs> wait, what's GHC? <laughs> just I use hugs. <laughs> hugs not drugs <laughs> anyhow uh yeah and then in, another great thing that happened in 2020 that was announced uh, near the end was the haskell foundation being formed um i think that was a a big win for 2020 yeah i'm really looking forward to seeing where that goes right now it's kind of nebulous like it is a good thing that it's there and they've secured a bunch of funding and all the right people are involved but what are they gonna do I want to see what happens. Yeah, if we can all sit there and like pet our our cat, cats in with a maniacal cackle, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bigglesworth, yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, those are definitely things. Like maybe at the end of 2021, we'll look back and say, you know, GHC9 was this watershed moment for the community. Linear types are amazing and changed the world. Um, and Haskell Foundation united all these disparate projects and really helped push the ball forward or push the lift the boat up, whatever the expression is. Row the um, boat. So, yeah, row the boat. Get everyone <laughs> rowing in the same direction. There we go. We got it there. Lift, lift the boat. <laughs> uh, where are we lifting? Rising, the rising tide lifts all boats is what I was going for. But Oh, gotcha. <laughs> we're all rising the tide, so we're just pouring there's, water into the ocean. Yeah, there's too many idioms to pick from. Yeah, you mixed them up. That's okay. We, we, like, mm-hmm. we like merged stuff here. It's a melting uh, pot. But yeah, so I'm going to put you back on the spot again since you, you know, denied my last time I asked the question. But what was, you know, one thing that sticks out in your mind of something you learned in 2020? It could be meta. It could be code related. It could be so. So I got style. something. It's kind of code related. And it's actually my um, my resolution for this year. And it is to write less code at work. So... For those listeners that aren't employees of IT Pro, um, I I manage the team of engineers here, but I also, in the past year and my whole time here, have done a lot of engineering myself. And I've found that um, it can often, I often use that as like a shortcut of like, I know how I want this done, so I'll just do it. But that kind of robs everyone else on the team of that opportunity of poking around and trying it out and seeing what works and what doesn't work. So one of my goals for the new year is to let my team explore the the space of how to solve problems and i'll i'll be happy to give direction and coach but um i want to write less code at work Mm. can i have that resolution too (laughs) (laughs) the whole team can't write less code or maybe we can maybe that's what we should go for yeah just minimalistic i mean no just kidding Mm -hmm. no I i think there's a lot to learn in 2021 looking forward to writing more code um solving more problems yeah oh so. that reminds me um i gave up on the advent of code on like day 22 or 23 we were talking about that on i think the last time rec- we mm-hmm. recorded how did you do on it cam <laughs> <laughs> chuckles just chuckles i mean if you count getting through day four part one as a win then yeah That's i think it's further than i made yeah. it in any other years of advent of code i think i totally skipped it in 2019 and in 2018 i did like a couple of days so it's just hard because like yeah i didn't have a ton of like you know here at the house we've got a, a new puppy we've, we're doing home renovation so like doing stuff outside of work is generally not coding uh, yeah so it it takes a surprising amount of time even if you're good at those types of puzzles it's you still have to like read it and understand what it's asking and try it out and debug it and you know then you want to write you know make your own code better and all that so yeah it's it's a big time commitment. Yeah, I wasn't wasn't ready for it. Yeah. So maybe I'll prep everything next year and just be like, all right, from December first to December twenty fifth, I code. I got an hour a day blocked out on my calendar. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> yeah, just take off time of work. It's like mm-hmm. can I take my sick sick days like an hour hour a day. Spread one time. sick day over a whole week. Yeah. Can I make that work? <laughs> We'll see. HR has to <laughs> has to weigh in on that. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair enough. But yeah, so you know, 
that's 2020. Now we're into heading into 2021. And, you know, we've got a, a new slew of opportunities for Haskell Weekly Podcast. And we actually also would love to invite any of our listeners or blog post authors who are interested in maybe sharing what they have to say on Haskell Weekly Podcast. We'd love for you to reach out. Um, Taylor, where can they find us? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, we have mentioned that before kind of in passing, but really, if you want to be a guest on the podcast, if you got something to say, or if we have grossly misrepresented one of your own blog posts, please come on and correct the record. Uh, and you can find us at haskellweekly.news, or you can email us at info at haskellweekly.news, or uh, Twitter, our handle is Haskell Weekly. Those are all the best ways to get us, or on GitHub, our username is Haskell Weekly, and you can make an issue on the repo or a pull request or whatever. Um, any of those places, I will hopefully notice and uh, get back to you. Yeah, or you can look up Taylor Fossack on Google, find his phone number, and call him. <laughs> Please don't. And hopefully my number is not online, but I screen all my calls. <laughs> yeah, at this point, I feel like everything's online. Yeah. Womp womp. Somebody will but, try to call me on Keybase or something, but not call there me anymore. on my shell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, anyhow. Let's not get into song here. Uh, but yeah, no, so thank you all listeners who joined us today. Um, we really enjoyed um, having Taylor on the show. Thank you again, man. Yeah, thanks for hosting. And, uh, I, you know, hopefully what my, another one of my resolutions here in 2021 is to actually record one of these podcasts every week. We did pretty good toward the end of the year last year, uh, and we did pretty good when we started, but there have been some big sabbaticals in between. So this yep. year, hopefully, we'll do better. Yeah, hopefully this year we'll be consistent because um, you know our sponsor, IT Pro TV, is allowing us to do this, and so we want to thank them. Um, they also want to thank you for listening. So if you're interested in IT Pro TV, the e-learning platform for IT professionals, I encourage you to go to itpro.tv and see what we have to offer. And if you're interested in a subscription, uh, there is a promo code available to you. It is Haskell Weekly 30 uh, that you can put in at checkout, and that will apply 30% off the lifetime of your subscription. So we would definitely encourage you to check it out, and we really appreciate you being on today. And I think that's all I've got. Anything else to add, <laughs> Taylor? Uh, that is it. Happy hacking. Have a good year, and adios. Peace.